Welcome to History Comes Alive, the podcast that takes you on a deep dive into a new historical topic every episode. Join us as we explore the nuances of historical events you probably didn't learn about in school. Here's your host, Jeff Nichols. Welcome back. This is the actual fourth and final episode of our study of Massasoit, Wampanoag Sacum and Friend of the Pilgrims. His life, his dedication, his contribution to the success of Plymouth Colony. We've got a lot to cover this week, and if you happen to catch the bonus episode, you're a little bit ahead of the curve. If you didn't, don't worry. You can always go back and listen to it later. You won't necessarily need it to follow along. Now, the last few episodes, we've examined the impact that Massasoit had on virtually every aspect of Plymouth's success. He had befriended them early on. He had provided them the promise of friendship and the pledge of mutual protection. He had provided them with helpers that showed them how to live and prosper in their new land. Massasoit had shrewdly calculated that in the pilgrims, he found the answers to some of his own problems. The Treaty of 1621 benefited both parties for years to come. The Treaty of 1621 affected everybody in the region, friends and enemies alike. In this final episode on the life and the impact of Massasoit, We'll explore many of the same events that we already spoke about. This time, however, we'll look at these times with the added transparency. I mean, you remember that illustration, right, of the of the anatomy, the body of the anatomy and the old encyclopedias of these, these transparencies that each layer added a, a different type of system to the human body? Well, in this episode, the transparency is going to be inserting Squanto and his actions into the narrative. You don't need to have listened to the previous four episodes, but if you did, it will help. The story today will move pretty quickly through some familiar ground for those of you that did listen. If you haven't listened, feel free to check them out. I think you'll still enjoy this episode. We want to come away with a greater understanding of both Squanto and Hobomock, but we'll also better understand Miles Standish and William Bradford and Massasoit himself. I mean, this is, after all, a series dedicated to him. The previous stories showed him to be a man of vision and discipline and humility, patience. And as we add to them this week, we'll see Massasoit emerged as an almost bigger-than-life character, a man with great restraint and great resilience, power and authority under control, a man able to navigate for decades around some very tenuous situations, most of which were completely out of his control, but somehow managed to manipulate to his advantage. It's important to begin our time today with a quick recap of the bonus episode. In it, we looked at the native concepts of religion, how it shaped their societies, their ways of thinking, their understanding of the world that they lived in. And as we concluded that time, I ended by saying this, Quote, in addition to all the spiritual and religious energy they lived with, there were two primary gods. One was unknown but benevolent, a great good god, distant from the people, called, among other names, Tanto, Kiatin, or Kautanatuit. There was also one more active in the affairs of men, one more directly involved. This one was dangerous. He was capable of good and evil toward the people. He went by various names. In the New England region, in the land of the Wampanoags, he was called Squanto or Hobomock. Well, how about that? The two ambassadors assigned to Plymouth by Massasoit himself went by the names Squanto and Hobomock. And Hobomock was a revered niece as well, a warrior spiritual man maybe the closest confidant of Massasoit. And we'll see, he and Squanto were more adversary than friend. End quote. Now, let's continue to fill out the activities of Massasoit in the life of Plymouth Colony by working through the final scenes Massasoit set in motion. The final scenes Massasoit almost lost everything to. The final scenes that made and preserved Massasoit's reputation in his day and beyond. It's amazing to consider that the dissident 
super saints, the ultra-conservative Christians of their day, those to the right of even the Puritans, the pilgrims, would allow Squanto and Hobomock to even come around Plymouth at all, let alone live there, let alone place their trust and security in their hands. Edward Winslow himself said that he believed Hobomock to be the devil. Nevertheless, these groups did form a friendship. And so, starting at the beginning again, early on in the history of Plymouth Colony, Squanto and then Hobomock were sent to live with the pilgrims by Massasoit, and they were a great help. As a quick review, Hobomock was a distinguished local native, a close confidant of Massasoit. He was a niece. I mean, that is to say he's a super warrior with spiritual powers. He's a ninja priest, a, a special forces holy guy. It was said that nieces could not be killed in battle. They were feared for their power and for the power that they were be able to project from the spirit realm. It was said that they can converse with the spirits and conjure their power into reality. Squanto was quite the world traveler. He had been raised right there in the very land that Plymouth was founded. He'd been kidnapped and taken to Spain as a young man. He had been sold into slavery, and he made his way to England, and he lived there for a while. And then he went to Maine to help colonize at the will of Ferdinando Gorges and his crowd. He went back to England and then again crossed the Atlantic and found himself back in the Cape Cod area. His village had been wiped out by plague. He was a Wampanoag, and he had returned in 1619. The pilgrims arrived via the Mayflower the following year. To me, it seems he may have had the broadest overall life experience of anybody in our immediate story, at least as broad as anybody in our immediate story. Squanto was a true man of the world. He understood both Spain, the reigning world power, and England, the up-and-comers. He was familiar with all the local native ways and customs. I mean, he seems like he knew everybody. Squanto seemed like the perfect ambassador to bridge the gap between English and native. He assisted Plymouth for the rest of his life, which frankly was only about a year and a half. No doubt he was a valuable resource, but he had ambitions of his own. He knew what he needed to do to get what he wanted. He understood diplomacy, manipulation, and he knew what people feared. He knew how to employ these things for his own benefit at the expense of others. It's hard to tell what they thought of each other, Squanto and Hobomock. I mean, overall, it's hard to tell, but they did conduct themselves differently. The pilgrims were not taking chances. William Bradford and Miles Standish eventually each dealt with only one of these men in a formal sense. Bradford was Squanto, whom he preferred. Bradford said of Squanto that he was, quote, a special instrument sent by God, end quote. And Standish dealt with Hobomock, kind of warrior to warrior. He preferred him anyways. We already saw how valuable Hobomock was in the massacre at Weymouth. Bradford did write of the jealousy, or at least the competition that had existed between these two men. So upon Squanto's commencement of service, he set to work to encourage the other natives to embrace the pilgrims. He'd been to England and could boast of the power of King James. This was a plus for the pilgrim reputation. The flip side is that he told those same natives that the pilgrims had the plague hidden in the floor of their storehouse. He told them he had the ability to influence the pilgrims to release it or not release it. And that was a terrifying thing. I mean, they'd already lost a bunch of people to these plagues. So his reputation among the natives grew. And when the pilgrims heard about this, they set the record straight. They did, however, tell the natives that their God did hold the plague in his hand and had the power to release it upon anybody that might threaten them. This was still a scary thing for them to hear, based on their own religion, what they believed about the character of God that they worshipped, and what they had already experienced with these plagues. But the reality is, <laughs> Squanto was still a liar. The pilgrims were as honest as possible with the natives. It would serve to calm some very tense times. The entire region seemed to be more at ease once the pilgrims settled in. They felt their charity, their fairness, and integrity, and it had a good effect. And so did outsiders, even years later. In 1628, Isaac de Razors of New Netherland was impressed by the natives' high regard for the English. 
In his opinion, the Indians, quote, better conducted themselves, end quote, because of the Pilgrim example. This was a work in progress, however. The first summer of 1621 was just as the relations were developing between Massasoit and the Pilgrims is when Squanto, Hobomock, and Taka Muhammad, you remember we mentioned him a couple of episodes ago. He was a guy that lived there for just a short time at Plymouth. Uh, well, anyways, those three guys had been kidnapped by Corbitant, a rebellious sachem under Massasoit. And peace had come through force at that point. By the end of the first growing season, then in 1621, the pilgrims were getting established in their new homeland. The harvest was a time to celebrate. It was a time of feasting. The celebration lasted three days. Massasoit was there. On the menu was assorted waterfowl and fish like cod and bass and native corn often eaten as cornbread or porridge. The natives provided the venison. What was not on the menu for that historic first Thanksgiving was turkey. Although good relations had been established that year, this must have been a tense time. At least it must have started out that way. I mean, I think it, it ended up more as a, a time of showmanship. But Massasoit had arrived with 90 warriors. That's intimidating. When he'd first arrived that spring, he only had 60. 90 warriors is quite a show of force. The pilgrims, not to be outdone, although they could not match the human force, demonstrated their firepower by discharging their weapons. Although I'm willing to bet it wasn't all at once. So that was the one thing Massasoit had wasted no time in requesting the previous spring, you know, when he first met the pilgrims, was he wanted guns. And that was the thing that the pilgrims had always resisted. They did not provide the Wampanoags with guns. So all was going well, but this is about the time that fractures began to appear. As I've stressed all along, human relations and diplomacy can be tricky things. Passions can run high. Emotions and loyalties can be stretched. There's times when courage and discipline are necessary and often lacking. When trusting the system is safer than trusting even our own senses. Sometimes we discern this and act, and sometimes we miss it. And quite frankly, sometimes we miss it on purpose. It's a funny thing about the trickiness of human relations and diplomacy. So in September of 1621, a year and a half before the healing of Massasoit and the eventual conflict with the Massachusetts, known as the Weymouth Massacre, a small party of pilgrims set out with Squanto for the Massachusetts Bay to trade for furs. The next six months would prove to be very interesting. Actually, Unbeknownst to all, this would be the countdown to the death of Squanto 14 months later. It would be a very busy 14 months for Squanto. Busy indeed, so buckle up. So again, things were going pretty well heading into the fall of 1621. The Massachusetts natives were going to become a trading partner via Squanto. That seemed good. Here's where the primary issue was. The Massachusetts tribe was located to the north of the Wampanoags and Plymouth. They controlled a pretty good pipeline for furs, and that could really help the pilgrims. They had an aggressive enemy to their north in the Abenaki, so the pilgrims looked like a really great ally for the Massachusetts. I mean, in them, they had a business partner and a friend with European weapons to help them in times of danger from regional adversaries. Does that scenario sound familiar? I mean, it sounds a lot like the relationship Massasoit had already formed. Here's the rub. Although it might not be accurate to say the Wampanoags and the Massachusetts were enemies, I mean, the Wampanoags had more immediate concerns, you know, about the Narragansetts, and the Massachusetts had their hands full with the Abenakis, but they were competitors for trade, and they were right next door to each other. As Massasoit's ambassador led his friends to his competition, Hobomuk looked on. The first manipulation by Squanto here was the very act of introducing the pilgrims to the Massachusetts as trade partners. Secondly, once en route, Squanto informed the pilgrims that the Massachusetts had been planning to attack them. His suggestion was to take the furs by force once they arrived. Wisely, the pilgrims refused to start any problems. Defend themselves against attack, they would do. Provoke hostilities, they would not. As it happened, the trading was a success. In fact, later it would be worked out that the Massachusetts would actually plant additional crops that would be harvested and sold to the English. 
That's a pretty slick little deal. Setting up for a long-term relationship. It was pure, unadulterated business. Organized, intentional, advantageous to both parties. I mean, file that a little factoid away for right now, because we're going to come back to that. So the initial interaction with the Massachusetts tribe was advantageous to Plymouth. Squanto had placed himself in high esteem with both groups. The initial interaction with the Massachusetts tribe was not advantageous to Massasoit, Squanto's leader and Plymouth's benefactor. You see where this is starting to head? I mean, and it gets better. Remember, my sentiment is that Squanto knew what he was doing. He was playing a dangerous game that ultimately would serve him best. Now, on the heels of the first trade expedition to the Massachusetts Bay, there came another interesting situation that Squanto took the lead in. Whether it was an accurate interpretation or not, his advice was ill-advised. Still irritated about the treaty Massasoit had made with the pilgrims, Canonicus, the chief sachem of the Narragansett tribe, the chief enemy of Massasoit, sent Plymouth a gift. Now, it's recorded that there had been a series of poor gift exchanges between these two groups already. I mean, and no doubt it was inspired and confounded by the growing friendship between Plymouth and Massasoit. Remember, it was the same Canonicus that had swayed Corbitant, a Wampanoag chief on the border with the Narragansetts, away from Massasoit the previous summer and into that ill-fated plot to kidnap Squanto and Hobamak and Takamahaman. So it was early in 1622, six months after that affair, that Canonicus sent an ominous gift. He sent a bundle of arrows wrapped in rattlesnake skins to Plymouth. And Squanto's interpretation was that it was a threat and a challenge. William Bradford was not shaken. He removed the arrows and replaced them with gunpowder and shot. His message to Canonicus was that he would not start trouble, but he would end it if it came. And that response scared Canonicus. He would not even entertain the snakeskin at his village. It was passed from village to village. Nobody wanted it. On the surface, the whole event seems to speak for itself. It would appear that Squanta was correct in his assessment and the threat was real. But I wonder, on the face of it, if Canonicus had really intended harm, I mean, if he meant to remove the pilgrims, at this point, he could have. It may have cost him some lives, but a sneak attack could have gotten the job done. He would have had to deal with the Wampanoag response, and maybe he wouldn't want that. And he had a bigger enemy to his west in the Pequots. Maybe he didn't want to somehow find himself in a war with both the Wampanoags in a response to the Plymouth thing and the Pequots, who may just certainly have played the opportunist at that point. I don't know. We'll meet the Pequots in a few weeks. They were something to behold. They held sway over everybody. They were to New England what the Iroquois Confederation was to New York and Pennsylvania. I mean, actually, these two had a history of bad blood. We'll get there. But they were the big boys. Also, what a terrible PR stunt for a guy who was supposedly looking for a problem, allowing all of his people to see the disrespect, or at least at a minimum, the indifference that the pilgrims apparently had to his threats. Anyway, I admit, I believe the gift, in air quotes, was menacing. But if you think about it, most of the other tribes had come to terms with the pilgrims the Wampanoags, the Massachusetts, the Nossets. I mean, the kidnapping hadn't ended well. Maybe Canonicus was really trying to establish at least a peaceful friendship. Frankly, I don't know. But here's the rub. Here's what I do know. Hobamak had advised the pilgrims against responding to Canonicus until they spoke with Massasoit and sought his counsel. This was a power move by Squanto. He dismissed Massasoit's value. When Massasoit heard the news, he charged Plymouth with breaking their treaty. He was angry. He must have been very well aware of what Squanto was doing. The pilgrims were just ignorant, to a point. I mean, Bradford liked Squanto. I can understand that, but a conflict with the Narragansetts would have absolutely engulfed the Wampanoags. And don't forget, Squanto had been telling the natives that the pilgrims had the plague stored up. He could convince them to unleash it. He told them he could convince the English to attack anyone he wanted them to. He told the natives of the power of King James. He told them that he could tap into that as well. 
At the same time, he was telling Plymouth of his prowess on their behalf with all the dangerous tribes out there. He was really protecting them with his own brand of diplomacy, I mean, blah, 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 whatever, Squanto. But his stature was growing. His fear-mongering and manipulation of folks was beginning to turn people away, even from their own sachems. Remember, if you listened to the bonus episode, we kind of covered the organizational structure of the native culture, the control mechanisms that they had in place. I mean, like all societies and cultures, Squanto was upsetting that. Just a little bit later, a couple of months, another trip to the Massachusetts Bay was planned for more trade with the Massachusetts tribe. They were open to friendship. They were leery, but they were open to the possibility. You know that feeling you get when you've gotten into the seat of the roller coaster and are ascending that first really big crest? Well, that's where we are in this tale, just about to hit the very top. When you hear the crack of the track and suddenly you're not looking ahead, you're looking straight out over the whole park and surrounding area, some people are amused by that feeling, some people scream, some puke. So the trading party, which included Squanto, Hobomock, and Miles Standish, had just left in the shallop when one of Squanto's relatives came running into Plymouth with blood running down his head, an apparent wound that he had received while trying to warn Plymouth of a combined attack that was imminent. The combined forces of Canonicus and Massasoit, along with Corbitant, were on their way to attack them. Now, I know they lived in a hostile environment, but they should have thought this through. It may have been easy to believe that Canonicus would attack, and maybe even Corbitant, but Massasoit would make no sense, especially with the Narragansetts. It could happen, but he had always presented himself as honorable. He'd already put up with a lot of their crap. He'd shown himself to be stable and level-headed. That would make no sense to me. It should have made no sense to the Pilgrim. I mean, they should have at least thought this through. But, you know, frankly, people do love a good conspiracy theory, don't they? Anyway, they quickly fired the cannon, which brought the just-departed traders back to Plymouth. Hobomock saw right through this. Thankfully, he took control. As the pilgrims readied for an attack, he sent his wife to Massasoit at Soamet, his village, 40 miles away, mind you, to see what the deal was. As suspected, Massasoit had no idea what was going on. It was all a ploy, a plot by Squanto, a power grab. I can't help but think before we move on, Homok sent his wife 40 miles away to Massasoit's town. Think about that. 40 miles, there weren't highways. She didn't hop in the car. She had to make her way through the wilderness. Maybe there was a small trail. I don't know. But that's quite a journey, 40 miles. And then back again. The problem was that this little doozy went above and beyond an inflated ego and self-worth. Squanto's plan had been to convince the pilgrims to lead a preemptive strike on Massasoit himself. Squanto's plan had been to convince the pilgrims to kill Massasoit, assassinate him. That took some set of balls, and he was found out. I wonder what went through his mind then. What went through the leadership's mind of Plymouth? What went through Hobomock's mind? Like anything else, insult and disgust can be measured in degrees. We tend to tolerate more based on our perceived need or the value of something. The alliance held for so many years because the focus was always more on the long game than any one play or incident. But this particular situation almost reversed that naturally occurring phenomenon. Squanto was enjoying his newfound influence. His target in this was not Canonicus or even Corbitant. It was Massasoit, the one guy that he, Squanto, recognized had more authority and clout than he did. The one guy who always would. And he had to go. Squanto knew not only the might of the gun, but the ability of Miles Standish. His thought was that if Standish targeted Massasoit, he'd get him. I mean, who cares what the cost would be? The Sakum would be out of the way, and Squanto's path would be clear. Strangely, the trade envoy did take place after this with the Massachusetts, and that budding friendship grew even more. Imagine Massasoit's reaction. I can understand his anger. I really appreciate his discipline and patience in all of this. 
The betrayal of the pilgrims through trade and alliance with the Massachusetts, the assassination plot from Squanto, a man that he had taken in and then assigned a pretty important role. And then I think, I mean, we've already caught Squanto lying and cheating several times here. Then I think to myself, maybe Massasoit never liked Squanto. Maybe the Plymouth gig was a convenient way to just get rid of him. Maybe that's why Hobomock was really there, to keep tabs on Squanto. It really makes no sense why there would have to be two or three guys at Plymouth, all doing the same thing. I mean, this was just a small settlement at this point. So back to the roller coaster analogy. Did you feel that tickle in your belly when we went right over the top of the crest? This episode was not over, not by a long shot. Massasoit made the trip to Plymouth personally. That must have been nerve-wracking. I doubt that he came alone. I doubt that he was feeling quite as festive as he had the previous fall. I'm surprised Hobomock had not already killed Squanto. I'll bet these were not very easygoing times around camp. So Massasoit wanted Squanto. Yeah, I'll bet he did. But the pilgrims somehow managed to convey the massive worth and trust that they had in him as a guide and a teacher. He was, after all, familiar with both Native and European culture. Think about this from Massasoit's perspective. These freaking Englishmen really did test his patience. I know, or at least I'm pretty sure, I'd have let them all have it at this point. I probably would not have left Plymouth until the last of the coals were turning to ashes. Remember when I quoted his son, King Philip, like 50 years after this fact, when he was addressing that generation of Englishmen? He reminded them that there was a time when his father, Massasoit, was as a parent and they, the English, were his little children, or something like that. It seems pretty accurate. Someone had to play the adult here, and it was not the Englishman. Let me ask you, have you ever been shockingly shocked? Like so shocked you can't think straight, and then you're relaxed? But as you worked through the event after the fact, you got mad all over again? That return to anger, I have found, is usually more determined on the second go-round. You agree with that? That's what happened to Massasoit here. He went away and got madder. Eventually, he sent a couple of guys to Plymouth to take care of Squanto. He tried to use native diplomacy. I mean, he actually sent beaver pelts as a gift. The reciprocal gift that was expected was Squanto. Now, remember when we first met Massasoit like three episodes ago? Remember, he wore a knife around his neck. It laid across his chest for everybody to see. Well, that knife had been given to his emissaries. They told the men of Plymouth that their instructions from Massasoit were to cut the hands and the head off of Squanto with that knife. That must have been a big knife. Massasoit even called on the Treaty of 1621 as his right. The treaty did say that if either party was threatened, the other would come to their aid. Certainly, an assassination plot would represent a threat. Although the furs were rejected, the pilgrims said that they would not trade a man's life for furs, they did reluctantly agree to honor the treaty, and their great guide and translator would be given over. I wonder how the whole conversation took place. I mean, what was going through the mind of William Bradford, or Miles Standish, or Edward Winslow, or Hobomock, or Squanto? Well, just in the nick of time, just as you're recovering from that first great toss of the roller coaster, here comes another, not as big, but on the heels of the first one, big enough. It's only the first in a series of small but rapid-paced jolts that you're about to face, and you laugh, or you puke, and you get yourself ready. So just in the nick of time, an unexpected ship was spotted near Plymouth Harbor. In those days, that could mean trouble, legitimately. The pilgrims quickly used this surprise as a very poor excuse to not hand Squanto over. They claimed that they had no idea what threat they were now facing, and they really needed Squanto. And the men, they were disgusted, Massasoit's men, but they left Plymouth with the furs and without Squanto's hands or head. Squanto never again wandered too far from the safety of the English. I don't know what Massasoit's response was. I didn't find that recorded. But the issue apparently was never brought up again. But hold on, this whole thing gets better. The ship was Thomas Weston's gang. You remember, the guys that would settle Wessagosset Colony. As far as the time frame, we're about six months away from Squanto's death. 
So there's a lot going on. I mean, this is a great big budget Hollywood production being played out right before our eyes. You remember the rest of the spring and summer of 1622, the Plymouth folks played host to this very unprepared group of would-be colonizers. They had come with supplies, but like zero experience for the colonial life. They couldn't farm, they couldn't hunt. They would be troubled pretty quick out of the gate, both while at Plymouth and then from their own colony of Wessagosset. We covered these guys pretty extensively a few episodes ago. And you recall, the Massachusetts tribe had agreed to plant extra crops to trade with the pilgrims. Well, consider that corn the Wessagosset colony would steal. Consider that theft, along with a lot of others, as part of the reason the friendship with Plymouth went south. The Massachusetts had been a little leery of the English, but had been building a good rapport with Plymouth. When the Wessagosset folks started to cause a problem, it seemed logical that the folks at Plymouth, the same folks that had been so fair previously, would naturally step in and make the troublemakers stop. As we've seen, that's how a lot of the native world worked. They policed themselves and each other. No wonder the Massachusetts could not understand why Plymouth would not help. I mean, under English law, they had no authority to do so. So as the situation grew starker and starker, as the relations grew more and more tense, as the Wessagosset colony frankly became more and more hungry, things got out of control. First, the Massachusetts basically overcharged the English for trade goods. Then they hired them out for labor when there was no money, nothing left to trade. Remember, one specific task was to build canoes. Now, let's back up a bit and reapproach this from a slightly different angle. Because meanwhile, Massasoit's disgust had gotten the better of him by late summer. He had cut off the Plymouth colony. He did not visit them. He did not trade with them. He who had been their biggest benefactor and best friend now showed open hostility. His warriors openly taunted the pilgrims. This was a dark time. The darkest time for Plymouth. I mean, actually, it's a dark time for Wessagosset, too. I mean, they weren't even going to make it out of this thing. Without the help of Massasoit and without the cooperation of the Massachusetts tribe, the two English colonies were reduced to eating groundnuts and shellfish. Boy, had they come a long way from the days of that first Thanksgiving. It's really a good thing that calmer heads prevailed, at least in Plymouth. The Wessagosset folks had pitched a plan for the English to launch a joint attack on the natives. I mean, like that would have ended well, right? Needless to say, Plymouth Colony was intimidated by all of this isolation and all of the danger that was being presented. It was during these days that there was even a division in Plymouth by Bradford's own account. As I said earlier, Bradford was still a Squanto guy, and it makes me question him a little sometimes. While Standish was a Hobomock guy, I think I would have been too. Standish understood the danger and got very busy readying Plymouth for the seemingly inevitable battle to come. But it didn't. Standish was in a bad place. He was a hired gun. He was not a pilgrim. He was not a Puritan. He was not in the leadership of Plymouth. His opinion really didn't count. I mean, if it had, they may have rid themselves of Squanto long before now. But then, way out of the bounds of normalcy, in October of 1622, Massasoit and Squanto came to terms and made nice with each other. The truce came very unexpectedly. It's very uncommon in Native culture, based on what had happened. Within days, the English colonies would form a joint venture under the leadership of Miles Standish and sail north along the coast in search of Natives that would trade with them. They may have made a few of these trips, but at any rate, they left a few days after Squanto and Massasoit made up. Squanto died on that trip. Officially, he died of Indian fever. He was said to have developed smallpox. But one observable symptom was an excessive bloody nose. And to the Indians, this was a symptom of death, often attributed to witchcraft or evil spirits. The circumstances and the timing are suspicious. The fact that even the most noteworthy Plymouth chroniclers recorded no real details is suspicious. I mean, was the reunion with Massasoit genuine? Did Massasoit have him killed? Did someone else in the group kill him? I mean, let's face it, whether you like Squanto or not, 
whether you appreciate some of his contributions, which there were many, don't misunderstand me, everyone was better off with him out of the picture. Just a few odds and ends to clean up here about Squanto. He had made a profession of faith in the Christian God. On his deathbed, he was purported as saying that he wanted to go to the Englishman's God in heaven. He bequeathed his earthly possessions to his English friends. It's believed that he may have been baptized by the Franciscans when he was in Spain, and he was even more certain to have been baptized by the Anglicans of England. It's odd. His name was a representation of the native equivalent basically to the devil, but he didn't change it when he was baptized. And it's odder still that the pilgrims accepted him and his name. He was an odd guy. He's a real enigma. I mean, I don't know. Maybe that's why guys like William Bradford remained faithful to Squanto. Maybe there was more to their friendship than meets the eye. Maybe it was faith-based. Maybe in all the treachery that he committed, all the lies that he told, there was more good done for the cause of Plymouth. Maybe when the scales were weighed, Squanto's contribution to Plymouth blinded all of his faults. I don't know. He did owe a lot to his English friends. Of course, they did kidnap him. At least one observer suggested maybe he was loyal to Ferdinando Gorges the whole time and his vision. I don't know. He was a fascinating man who had many gifts and talents, many exciting adventures. He made a huge impact on the lives of all of those people around him. I think he was very complex. I think he did like the English. I think that I would have liked him, but I know I would never have trusted him. But our story is not quite over. Squanto left a diplomatic mess. The rest of that particular trade mission was an absolute failure. The Massachusetts would not even trade for the corn that they had planted at the Pilgrim's request. They did eventually secure corn and beans from the Nossets on that trip. And relations did begin to improve a little bit. So six months later, when Massasoit was on his deathbed, you remember in March of 1623, It now becomes clear and much more understandable why there was talk that the pilgrims would not send an envoy to say goodbye. It's now clear why Massasoit was so happy to receive his old friend, Edward Winslow. It makes the healing at the hands of Winslow in the sight of so many witnesses. I mean, even the Dutch had sent representatives to pay their respects. It makes the healing at the hands of Winslow in the sight of so many witnesses that much more powerful a story. It makes the revelation of a coming attack by the Massachusetts so much more intriguing. I mean, how long had Massasoit known about it? Would he have gotten word to them if they had not come to his bedside? It's really something that they were even allowed to get close to the ailing sacum. I would imagine many of the natives there from a host of tribes, you remember there were a lot of folks crowded into Massasoit's town and even into his house. I would imagine many of those natives from a host of tribes had little use for the English at this point. The fact that the Wessagosset and Plymouth represented two very different groups meant little in the eyes of the natives. They were all Englishmen to them. Then one of those English groups, the first group, the one that they had begun to trust, did show up. They did not just show up, they saved the day. It was this scene that represents the final twist and turn of the roller coaster, the the epic scene, the final gotcha. With advanced knowledge of the peril to come, the pilgrims, under the leadership of Miles Standish, with his warrior friend Hobomach, took out the leaders of the Massachusetts aggressors. If you remember, he cut the head off of Wittawamit and impaled it back at Plymouth. The times would be tough for a while in Plymouth. They lost a lot of respect from the natives because of the messes made by Squanto and the Wessagosset colony. But their most important friend and ally, their greatest benefactor, was again on their side. With the death of Squanto, the healing of Massasoit, and the massacre at Weymouth, which not only weakened Massasoit's rivals by taking out several of their warriors, including a few nieces, It caused the abandonment of Wessagosset Colony. The troublemakers were gone. The Treaty of 1621 was restored. Plymouth had gone a long way in cleaning up their own mess. To summarize the life of Massasoit, I want to read the final paragraph of an article written by John H. Hummins for the New England Quarterly. 
Despite Massasoit's efforts and policies, Squanto's rule has been celebrated in American culture, and he has been elevated to the status of noble savage. Consequently, the historical understanding of a very complicated situation has become distorted and oversimplified, and Massasoit's role and policies in turn have been obscured. A politically astute leader, Massasoit devised a diplomatic plan to provide greater security for himself, his weakened confederation, and the English plantation. But this plan was disrupted by Squanto, an individual bent on becoming the Indian chief for the English newcomers. Squanto's bold actions temporarily thwarted Massasoit's strategy and led to an intense rivalry, which ultimately jeopardized the Indian-Pilgrim relationship. After a struggle lasting several months, Squanto was dead, and Massasoit's restored policy of cooperation and friendship assured Pilgrim survival and ushered in a new epic in New England. That's a great quote. Well, that's our extended look at the extraordinary life of Massasoit, principal sachem of the Wampanoag tribe who lived around the Cape Cod area in 20-plus villages at the time of Plymouth Colony. I do believe a good portion of the credit the lion's share for the success of the pilgrims and the Puritans soon to follow can be laid at Massasoit's feet. It's kind of sad, it's kind of frustrating to me that he does not receive the credit he so aptly do. Maybe it's because he was a native. Maybe it's because William Bradford was a Squanto guy. Maybe that's just how it goes. So as the roller coaster pulls into the lodge and the movie credits begin to roll in my metaphorical mind's eye, I hope this has been a fun exercise for you. It's been fun for me. I hope you'll join me again next week as we begin to explore the early European expansion of New England. But until then, I hope this episode has really helped the history to come alive. Thanks for listening to History Comes Alive. We hope today's episode has given you valuable new information and inspired you to dive even deeper. Don't forget to check out Jeff's website, historywithjeff.com, and engage with Jeff across all your favorite social media platforms at History with Jeff. Join us next time as more history comes alive.